Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome to week two. And if you remember, the overall purpose of this part, this part two of this course that we just started last week is to talk about atomistic models for nanoscale devices. And the basic picture we have in mind is this idea of an elastic resistor broadly, where electrons can go through the channel region essentially without interactions and the heating and other things is basically in the contacts. Now, the first step, of course, to describing any resistor is this a good description of the channel. And that's this H matrix, or I guess technically what you call it, the Hamiltonian matrix. And what I tried to get across in week one of this course was how one writes down that H matrix. And the starting point is this Schrodinger equation. And if you recall, we had these two versions there. One is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and the other is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And just to distinguish the size that appear in these two, I guess I've put a tilde on there. I believe last week I might have written it with, in a slightly different way. I might have written it something like this. But just to be clear, I'll put a tilde on this time-dependent one. That way there's no confusion. And in general, you see, we are talking about steady state transport, which means things are flowing smoothly, not changing with time. And much of the time we'll be using this time independent Schrodinger equation. It's just that once in a while when trying to clarify certain concepts, it's useful to go back to the time dependent one. But by and large, we'll be doing the time independent one. Now, <clears throat> so what we did last week, I guess, was seeing how to write down this H matrix. And there, of course, number of concepts were involved because in the Schrodinger equation, basically H is an operator, a differential operator. And it takes some, some discussion to re recognize how it's written as a matrix, how one chooses the elements of that matrix. But that's all kind of what was week one. This week, what I really want to talk about is essentially how, once you have this H matrix, how you'd actually calculate current, actually analyze a device. And that requires one to understand how to connect it to the two contacts. So in a way, you could say what we are doing this week is talking about how to connect contacts to the Schrodinger equation, or what I often put in quotes as contacting Schrodinger. Okay? And the first step in that is, this is what we'll be discussing in the next, this module and the next, is that to this standard Schrodinger equation, see, if you include these contacts, what you get is two extra terms here. Something that we'll call the sigma, psi, and as you'll see, the sigma has two components, like sigma one and sigma two, one due to contact one, one due to contact two, and then there'll be another term, which is like this, what you could call the source term. And that describes how electrons come in from the contacts into the device. And in principle, again, there, you could have a S1 and a S2 from the two contacts. So the first couple of modules in this week then, what I'll try to explain is how the standard Schrodinger equation gets modified into this one. That's what I'll be trying to give you a feeling for. Now, for the moment then, I guess I'll come back to it in the next module, come back to this equation in the next module. What I want to first do is give you a simple picture of how to describe current through a one level device. And by one level, what I mean is, see, usually we are talking of devices with many levels and they're described by this density of states. But supposing we consider something very simple. Let's say just a one level here. With some energy epsilon. So what that means is, when it comes to the Schrodinger equation, it's actually very simple because 
this H matrix, instead of being a matrix, is just one number, epsilon. And similarly, the psi, instead of being a column vector, is actually just a number. So it's almost like an algebraic equation then, when you're talking about a one-level device. So what we'll do then, I want to start with this one-level device and talk about how you add contacts to Schrodinger equation, just with the one level. And once you understand the one level, you'll see that the matrix version kind of follows in an intuitive way. That's what I'll be trying to do. So I'll come back to this Schrodinger equation then again in module two of this week. But for the moment, let me first try to explain how you do the one level device in a, what you might call a semi-classical way. That is without bringing in wave functions in a common sense way. Let's first do that one and then we'll come back to it in the next module. So let me take this off, we'll come back to this. Okay. So if you are trying to do a simple common sense description of a one level device like this, you could say well the number of electrons in this, in this level can be anywhere between 0 and 1 and I'll call that say n. That's the number of electrons in this device. And electrons can come in from the contacts, this contact or that contact, and can again go out into the contacts. So I could write a differential equation looking something like this. dn dt, that's the rate at which electrons, the number of electrons in that level change with time. And what, why does it change? Well. One reason is electrons could be going out of, uh, let me get a little more space here, I'll move it over here. So why does it change uh, with time? Well, one possibility is electrons could be going out from the level into the contacts and that would be proportional to nu1 times n. So what I've written here, this has the dimensions of per second. So it tells you that what is the rate at which electrons leak out into the contacts, into contact one. And of course, if electrons leak out, then the number of electrons in that level would be going down with time, and so there should be a minus there. Similarly, electrons could leak out into contact two. So, so I could write that as minus nu2 times n. And then you have electrons that are coming in from the contact, from contact one, and that part of course does not depend on n, so it's a number we'll write as say s1. And then there is a number that rate at which electrons come in from contact two. So let me write that as s2. So those are the terms really, you see. So the first term here, first two terms here tell you about the exchange of electrons with contact one. The second two terms are about the exchange of electrons with contact two. And dn dt, the rate at which the number changes depends on this plus this because see this tells you the rate, a net rate at which things come in from one. This is the net rate at which things come in from two. Now at steady state, steady state means when nothing changes with time anymore, then you see I can put this equal to zero. I can drop this, it's equal to zero. And so st at steady state, the number of electrons inside can be written as, see if you solve this, you see there's S1 plus S2, And then this two terms that involve n, I could put on this side. And what that means is, I can divide through by this term and get the steady state number. So this is the steady state number of electrons inside the, that one level, or occupying that one level. Okay. Now, 
You see, we have got these two parameters here, this new one and new two. You know, that tells you the, this per second, how easily electrons can get out into the contacts. If you have very good contacts, those could be like once every picosecond. If you had a really bad contact, it could be like once every second, for example. Okay. Now, the point I want to make is that these new, that's this, what you might call the escape rate, if you will, that is related to the source, strength of the source. That is, if you have a good contact, new one would be big, but so would S1. If you had a good contact two, new two would be big, but so would be, so would be S2. And the way you can see it is the following, and this is an important argument, and that is that supposing we have only contact one connected, you see? So supposing we had a device where there is only one contact, the other contact was completely disconnected. Then of course, according to that formula, n should be equal to s1 divided by nu1. But what I could argue is that if I have a device with only one contact, then it's in equilibrium with that contact. I really don't need a rate equation like this to tell me how many electrons there will be. I know that the number of electrons inside should be given by the Fermi function because it's basically in equilibrium with contact one. So it should be the Fermi function for contact one. So this will be equal to F1. And of course the Fermi function is a function of energy. Here what matters is the energy at which that level, we have this level, which I called epsilon. So it would be this F1 of epsilon. So from here on, I won't bother to write the epsilon. I'll write F1, which means the Fermi function in contact one at energy equal to epsilon. So this then immediately relates for me the strength of this S1, strength of the source term to this escape rate. And of course, you'd have a, you could make exactly the same argument for contact two as well. And so you'd have a relation, something like this. Okay. Now the next thing I want to explain is how you could take this steady state N you see, at steady state, dn dt is zero, but that doesn't mean the currents are zero. At equilibrium, currents are zero, but when you have steady state flow, the currents are not zero. In fact, this first term here is the current at contact one coming in. The second term is the current at contact two coming in. And of course, one must exactly cancel the other. And so, if I want the current through this device, I could either calculate that quantity or I could calculate that quantity. You see, one of them, and it would tell you the current, the, the steady state current. So let's say we evaluate this quantity. That would give me I1. So I1 then is given by S1 minus nu1 n. So that's like S1 minus nu1 and N is given by this steady state thing. That's it. So this is then like the current, that is the rate at which electrons, net rate at which electrons come in from contact one. Now if I actually wanted the electron current, I should of course multiply it by the charge on an electron. So for the moment, I'll just write this as I1 divided by Q. That is, if I take this and multiply by Q, I'll get the charge current, okay? Now I can do just a little simplification algebraically. Let me take this off from here. Just for reference, I could keep this here. Don't think I'll need it anymore, but just for reference. Now, if I simplify this a little bit, you see what you get, you'd get nu1 plus nu2 in the denominator, okay? And 
the new one S1 cancels new one S1 here and then you have the new two S1. See? Minus new one S2. But what we have done already is we have shown that S1 is equal to new one F1 and S2 is new two F2. So I could replace S1 with new one F1 and I can replace the S2 with new two F2. Okay. So this is I1 divided by Q. And that gives us the final answer that I was trying to get, which is that I1 is equal to Q times new one new two divided by new one plus new two times F1 minus F2. See? That's the algebra then. And so what we have now is an expression for the current. It is proportional to F1 minus F2 as it should be for elastic resistors. This if you haven't take, do not remember this from part one of the course, you could look at the lecture notes, the world scientific lecture notes, you know the first couple of chapters, two or three chapters, that's where, or two or three lectures, I think that's what's, how it's called, where this is done. And you have this quantity here, you see for a single level, you could have expected that this term here should be something like Q divided by T, you see, because T is, if you think of T as the transfer time, that is, how long does it take for an electron to get from one to two? Then you could have argued that the current through a single level must be Q divided by the transfer time. And so you could interpret this quantity as the net transfer time. How long does it take to, for an electron to get from contact one to contact two? And you can see, this divided by new one plus new two. I'll take off the Q, that's this one over T. And you could easily write this as, just with a little algebra, if you turn it around, you could write it as T is equal to one over new one plus one over new two. And that gives you a simple intuitive feeling for this, that what is the net time it takes for an electron to get from one to two? Well, it's the sum of two times. The first one is like sort of the time it takes to cross interface one. Second one is the time it takes to cross interface two. And of course, this is just a one level device. There's no real transit time involved at all in getting through the device. Okay, so, so this would be then the expression for the current when we treat a one level device in this simple semi-classical picture, see? And the important concept to get, that I wanted to get across is how you can make this argument about if you take out one contact so that you have only one contact left, then by looking at that case, you can argue that the level then must be in equilibrium with that contact and that gives you a relationship between the source term, the rate at which electrons come in from the contact to this escape rate, the rate at which electrons can get out from the contact. So there is this connection between the two which must be maintained in order to describe the equilibrium situation correctly. So in the next module then, we'll come back to, we'll do this from Schrodinger equation. We'll do the quantum version of this.